Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see a packed house here for the third day, uh, to kick off the third day of the 2019 Raisina Dialogue. Um, we're here today to discuss the New Delhi Consensus. My name is Dhruva Jayashankar. I'm a fellow Foreign Policy Studies at Brookings India here in New Delhi. Before I introduce the panelists, and we have an excellent panel here to kick off uh, this session, um, I'd like to provide some of the context. Why are we discussing the New Delhi Consensus here today? Uh, in some ways, this is a natural con continuation of the discussions we had yesterday and uh, day before evening. But I think uh, just to summarize what the changes we're seeing in the global context, um, we have uh, a number of developments uh, of political significance that are having major geopolitical ramifications around the world. In the United States, we have a president, Donald Trump, who has questioned many elements of the Washington consensus, uh, which uh, in some ways has coincided with uh, or, or something we've become accustomed to uh, in the post-Cold War years. Uh, and this has manifested itself in the US withdrawal from the Paris Climate Treaty, the skepticism of multilateral trade agreements, and in questions about burden sharing, uh, in, particularly in Europe and in Asia. Um, but so far, in many ways, America First has not yet become America alone. Uh, and many elements of the Washington Consensus remain, uh, um, uh, remain relevant. Similarly, there have been question marks about the Brussels Consensus, something that was being touted about 15 years ago with EU expansion. Um, and we've seen, particularly since 2008, a number of crises afflict the European Union, including the Euro crisis, a refugee crisis, a Ukraine crisis, and that has resulted uh, in combination in rising Euroscepticism uh, in many European countries, manifested most prominently, of course, in the Brexit referendum two years ago. So, of course, the questions then are, can there be a Beijing consensus? Uh, and certainly that's something that President Xi Jinping has touted at Davos uh, when he spoke a couple of years ago. Uh, and yet we've also seen China run into a number of challenges, whether it's resistance to the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the subject of a discussion yesterday, uh, whether it's the law of the sea, where we've seen um, uh, international arbitration against uh, China's uh, activities in the South China Sea in particular, um, and whether it's questions of interference in others' political systems. And so in India, we've seen for the first time, perhaps, uh, articulations of India as an aspiring leading power. Um, and uh, this has not been met uh, without criticism. There certainly has been some skepticism about what that means and whether India has the ability to deliver on its ambitions. Uh, but also, what does that New Delhi consensus look like? So to discuss all of this with, with that backdrop, uh, we have an excellent panel here, and I'll just briefly introduce them. Um, and in some ways, we'll hear a view from India, from three rather contested regions in the world, and also a global institutional perspective. Uh, we have uh, General V.K. Singh, uh, Minister of State uh, for External Affairs here from India, former Chief of Army Staff as well. Um, we have Dr. Maliki Osman, who is uh, Senior Minister of State uh, for, from Singapore for both external foreign affairs and defense. Uh, Ron Prosser, who is uh, from Israel, uh, he's now an academic but had a distinguished uh, diplomatic career, including as uh, Israel's ambassador to the UN and to the UK. Uh, Teresa Fallon, who is the founder and director for the Center for Russia, Europe, and Asia Studies in Brussels, who can provide us with a European perspective. And uh, finally, uh, last but not least, somebody who's not a stranger in these parts, uh, Dr. David Malone, Rector of the UN University, a former Canadian diplomat who was the envoy to the United Nations and also High Commissioner here in New Delhi. So let me start by asking a question to uh, General Vicky Singh, uh, uh, who of course uh, uh, represents the Indian government. Um, General, uh, what are uh, some of the characteristics in your view of this emerging New Delhi consensus? Please. See, whenever uh you talk of uh, leading parts or you talk of uh, uh, countries which will make a difference in the world, you need to have certain ingredients. Uh, all those who have studied McIntyre understand uh, what he laid down. However, in today's world, there are many more things that are required. One, what is the industrial and technological base of a country? What is the kind of uh, manpower that is available 
to leverage these two and how do you connect to rest of the world in terms of uh, making friends, influencing friends and taking them along on the path that you have charted for yourself. Now when you look at all these, I think today India is in a position where it has created many more friends, where it has the required technological base which can be exploited, where it is ensuring that it has uh, leverages with the people and countries who are way ahead in technology and diplomatically it has been able to create an environment where it has been able to make friends with large number of countries. And therefore, when India says that it is able to look for a role for itself, I uh, won't say a leading power, a role which is uh, proactive, a role which is benevolent, a role which uh, makes a mark, I think the ingredients are there today in terms of uh, the achievements that India has been able to achieve. A country which uh, is predicted to have a economic growth rate of uh, more than 7% in the next, uh, continuously in the next five years, obviously it will have a certain amount of economic strength where it will be able to influence and make more friends in its path that it has chosen for itself. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, before I turn to the other speaker, if a, a quick follow-up. Um, you rightly pointed out many of India's strengths. It's, uh, you know, rising uh, population, the dynamism of its economy, the access to technology, its, its many uh, friends around the world, and India's pulled off some uh, uh, sometimes some very tricky balancing acts diplomatically. But is India able to, do you think, meet its potential uh, without, um, uh, in, uh, in the absence of large-scale bureaucratic or military reforms? I mean, uh, somebody who served as army chief and as uh, in the external affairs ministry, uh, do you think India is fully able to tap all of these strengths and leverage them? See, when you uh, think big, when you want to go on a path which uh, is progressive, reforms must come through. As uh, you look at the demographic dividend that India has, a very youthful profile of its demography, if this demography is not utilized productively, obviously there will be hurdles. So you have to find ways and means of ensuring that all these ingredients are utilized in a manner in which you are able to achieve the aim that you have laid for yourself. Obviously, it implies that there will be changes. It implies that you have to do things better. Haven't we seen this in the last four and a half years? When we talked of uh, uh, minimum governance, or sorry, minimum government, where things were put in a manner in which you were able to reach a larger uh, part of population without creating a very large bureaucracy. Even in bureaucracy, the procedures, the methods, the way of dealing has to be changed. We identified large number of aspirational uh, districts in which uh, the progress was slow. And you chose people from the bureaucracy to go out there and see as to how they can raise it. And let me tell you, those aspirational districts have made tremendous progress. So it is when you lay down targets, when you motivate people, when you think big, when you ensure that uh, everybody moves on the same path with you, you will achieve the targets that you've laid for yourself. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Maliki, uh, you come from a region uh, or a country from in, in, in a region that uh, in some ways is becoming increasingly contested. There are a lot of, in some ways, stresses on uh, on ASEAN-led institutional um, uh, institutional leadership. Um, what do you, from your perspective, uh, what do you think uh, India can, what role can India be playing uh, in your region, and what would you like to see India doing more of? 
there's a lot that we can talk about, we can see how India can do more. But I think as we're talking about global expectations, maybe I just set off the context uh, of this discussion on uh, global circumstances. There are quite a lot of things that's happening around the world today. First, uh, the world order, as we know, is changing, uh, and certain long-held norms uh, are being questioned, and global economy is really, really being tested. We saw uh, global powers uh, having tensions as well as economic front. Uh, secondly, the challenges that we now face, uh, for example, terrorism, cybersecurity, climate change, or even lately, fake news, uh, all uh, increasingly cross-border. Uh, thirdly, we also have uh, stepped up into this digital age that heralds a new set of challenges, yet, of course, uh, opportunities. So against this backdrop of uh, global circumstances, let me turn to uh, the expectations of East Asia uh, and Singapore of the role that India can play. Uh, so I would like to frame my comments within the context of Prime Minister Modi's uh, keynote address at the 2018 Shangri-La Dialogue uh, recently, where he articulated a comprehensive web of strategic partnerships between India and major countries and regions, uh, propelling India's role into uh, the world stage. For Southeast Asia, uh, Prime Minister Modi signaled clearly the intent to deepen regional engagement through economic, defence and strategic partnerships. So the intent from India's perspective is indeed uh, very clear. So from the region's perspective in Southeast Asia and ASEAN, we support Prime Minister Modi's uh, vision of, uh, for India to play a more substantial role. Uh, so let me outline some of these um, in three broad areas. One is in economic opportunities that exist. Um, two, uh, the strategic opportunities as well as uh, digital opportunities. First on economic opportunity, as anti-free trade cries strengthen and markets um, have been shaken, it is really timely for India to exercise leadership on the economic front. Um, as the fastest growing economy in the world and a market of over 1 billion people, India's actions are closely watched by remaining open to trade and press, uh, pressing on with economic integration. India will send a strong signal that it remains open for business. I think that's very important. Secondly, from Southeast Asia's perspective, there is certainly much more business to be done. For example, in 2017, ASEAN's trade in goods with India stood at 73.6 US, billion US dollars, while the same figure for China, Japan, and South Korea ran upwards of 150 billion US dollars each. So we are really uh, thinking that there's much more that can be done economically between India and Southeast Asia. Uh, the, uh, we're also working towards the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, as you know, RCEP, which will create the world's largest trading bloc uh, once finalized and include some of the world's largest economies. As uh, one of the largest economies in the grouping, uh, India's efforts have a significant impact on the conclusion of this agreement. So India's moves to resolve bilateral trade uh, issues with uh, other asset partners like China is a positive step that will help bring closer to the finalization of this agreement. On the strategic front, uh, let me just very quickly talk about beyond economics and trade. We also see India play a, very, a much bigger role in the defense and strategic front. India's continued participation in ASEAN uh, through platforms such as the ADMM Plus, the East Asian Summit, remains crucial in addressing the common threats uh, like piracy and opportunities in the region. We look forward to greater practical security cooperation between India and Southeast Asia, particularly through the inaugural edition of the Trilateral Maritime Exercise among India, Singapore and Thailand in Andaman Seas uh, in 2019. Lastly, on digital opportunities, um, I think in the digital age, new areas of cooperation such as fintech have emerged and India is well placed to lead in fintech developments given its strong expertise in IT and the great strides it has made within India itself. To this end, Singapore and India have paved the way by greatly strengthening digital connectivity uh, such as linking up India's rupee digital payments with our own Singapore's uh, network of electronic transfers to facilitate cross-border uh, financial transactions. So just in close, um, the current global geopolitical and economic climate present opportunities for India to open a new stage of development and shape its external profile. It is, also, uh, it is not a straight-line trajectory or without challenges, 
But we in uh, Southeast Asia is optimistic that if India has the will, it will be able to play a forward-looking constructive role that PM Modi has set out in his speech in the Shangri-La Dialogue. Uh, thank you, Minister. You, last year, we were uh, treated to the site of uh, an India-ASEAN summit here in New Delhi when the leaders of all 10 ASEAN countries came for India's Republic Day celebrations. Um, and at the time, your Prime Minister, Lee Hsien Loong, wrote an, uh, uh, wrote an article that appeared in the Indian press where he highlighted some of the priorities uh, for, for the relationship. In addition to RCEP, which you mentioned, uh, the trade agreement, he also mentioned air connectivity uh, and smart cities. Uh, do you see these still as areas uh, uh, of uh, potentially worthy of ex exploration? Or oh, absolutely. I think uh, air connectivity is one of the key areas that we think has great potential uh, for India. And we look at businesses. Uh, most firms will tell us that uh, if there's little connectivity, there's very little that they can do as far as investments is concerned. And in our experience is that, um, for example, in Southeast Asia, uh, when Cambodia opens up the airspace, Samrip uh, benefited significantly uh, in terms of tourism. And if you do the same thing for India, I think the potential for India to actually reap benefits from uh, greater uh, open skies uh, policy would be tremendous. Thank you. Now we've looked to the east. Uh, turning to the west, uh, this is another region that's in a certain uh, degree of uh, tumult, uh, some might say chaos, uh, and yet India has so far been ma managed to forge uh, some very close partnerships with a variety of actors uh, to its west, and this is manifested uh, not least in this dialogue. Uh, last year we had Prime Minister Netanyahu from Israel uh, giving the keynote. Just last night we heard uh, from uh, Foreign Minister Zarif from Iran, uh, just to show the diversity of India's relations. Uh, if I can turn to uh, Ambassador Prosser, um, uh, some might say that the Middle East, uh, and I think Tony Blair hinted at this yesterday, uh, the Middle East is the graveyard of anybody who wants to intervene <laughs> or, uh, or to mediate. Um, but in, in, given India's relationships, what, do you th what role do you see uh, that India can play or should play uh, in, in the broader Middle East? First of all, uh, thank, you for, thank you for having me here. And I'm going to surprise you. I mean, uh, I really want to thank uh, Foreign Minister Zarif and Iran. I mean, no one has been able to bring Israel and the Arab world more together than Iran. <laughs> in the sense, uh, in 70 years, we've been really trying. And the Iranians brought us together and the fact that I came here, by the way, thank you for the invitation, was with Air India flying over Saudi Arabia. So India already profited from this amazing new relationship that we have above the radar screen and under the radar screen. And in the sense, why am I saying it? Because I think the Arab world, in essence, strategically understood that Israel is part of the solution and not part of the problem. They feel that the rope is tightening around their necks because of Iran. By the way, I felt a bit yesterday, I felt very comfortable because I have thought for a second I was at the United Nations. Uh, countries that uh, supposedly represent Jeffersonian democracies spoke here, like Iran and others, you know, uh, giving us guidance on what to do. So I really felt at home, but in the sense what is really amazing is when you look at it, and especially democracies, democracies are not easy. Uh, we see both leaders, Modi and uh, Netanyahu, having elections very, very soon. Democracies are something uh, sometimes inefficient. It's uh, tiresome. It's, but that's not just the best we have, but it really gives us, as societies, the ability to really become better. But the issue here is for democracies to begin to understand that they have to defend themselves. And we in Israel feel that we are on the front line encountering phenomena that democracies have still yet to grasp and deal with. I'll give you examples so it doesn't sound theoretical. We began in Israel checking people at airports 25 years ago. And what did people say? Oi, 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 intrusion of privacy, human rights, how can you do this, ta, 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 ta. Look at every airport today, and of course you understand that democracies have to find ways 
to defend themselves. And the issue here is the calibration. How do you calibrate? Defending on the one side and not going overboard on the other. But in essence, this is something that Israel deals with on a daily basis. Now, you know, why are we dealing with this? Because when we look at our strategic environment, we have a problem, you know, identifying Liechtenstein and Luxembourg on the map. So, in essence, our environment and the strategic environment force us to be very innovative in the way we work both internally and externally. And I think what is interesting and things that, you know, one could look at is that Israel's technology, Israel, you know, high tech, began with basically looking at our liabilities and turning them into assets. So we have the scientific evidence that Moses wasn't a great navigator. It took him 40 years to take the Jewish people out of Egypt and he stuck us in the only place, there's no drop of oil. So we had to work from the neck upwards. And in the sense, when you look at it, we were promised a land of milk and honey. When we got there, there was no milk, no honey, and no money. <laughs> and at the end of the day, when you have to really push, you know, the boundaries, what we found out that we have, General, to allocate resources anyhow to Israel's army. Why? Because it's a survival issue. But what we managed to do is take the so-called liability called the army, and basically, when we have the best at the brightest minds at the age of 18 because of mandatory service, we position them at a place where they have an added value. And just think of every year the best at the brightest minds turning technologies that basically come from the defense area and turning them into civilian issues. So in the sense, trying to protect Israel with a tier of missiles against Iran, the Aero program, the Iron Dome, is the base for our space program. When we deal with, for example, a combination of uh, scientists and doctors, we invent something which is called a pill that basically goes into your stomach and is able to give you, it's like a submarine, like Isaac Asimov, basically giving you a picture of your intestines to what happens drip irrigation, desalinization, liabilities that we basically turn. And when Israel today can stand up in the world and say we're really on the forefront of cyber, of course we're on the forefront of cyber. Because we, be, because of our neighborhood, had to deal with this years ago. Cyber uh, on, you know, on issues that present Israel we, I think, as uh, when I look at India and Israel, you know, it's like the elephant and the mouse. Sometimes we think we're a mighty mouse, but we're still a mouse. And in the sense, it really presents an amazing cooperation. And I also have to say that uh, from my point of view, and this is a, you know, a revelation, I think the, really, the secret and the secret weapon that we have which is very similar to India, is the Jewish mother, like the Indian mother. They are basically convinced that their children are geniuses. <laughs> and the world has to really find out what they know from birth. So if they fail, they say, try again. The world will find out what I know from birth. And the support for failure, in essence, is an amazing asset that creates this very diverse and lively democracies so we give each other heart attacks on the political side. Just think, 8 million Israelis, we have more than 20 parties. It's, uh, and every day there's a new party being established. So in the sense, this vibrant discussions internally create this amazing society, which I think uh, uh, one could learn from, especially when you deal with the area that we live in. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, if I can turn to uh, Teresa, another uh, increasingly contested area, it seems, a region, uh, part of the world, is, is Europe as well. Um, and, uh, of course, we've seen some stresses on the transatlantic relationship on the one hand, uh, some 
question marks about uh, Europe's relations with China on the other. So give us some context to this. Uh, how does Europe see these developments uh, uh, which, which are having large scale implications and what does that mean for Europe-India relations? Thank you very much. I want to thank the audience for showing up nice and early this morning for this event. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, about 30 years ago was my first trip to China. I'm sorry, to India, excuse me. China, China, China on my mind, sorry. And um, uh, this is the first time I've been back with my husband. So 22 years ago when we were first married, we traveled around India together. We were young then and had uh, time, not a lot of money, but a lot of time. So it was a real pleasure to be back here with my children uh, prior to this event. So that's a really good question. Now we see China dream as Xi Jinping has articulated, but what does that mean for the European dream? And Europe has genuinely just been kind of insular looking inwards and they've rediscovered geopolitics and this is because they don't have much choice anymore. Um, on paper it would seem that Europe and the US have the same complaints about China. The European Chamber of Commerce Book of Complaints is just as thick as the US Chamber of Commerce Book of Complaints and you would think that this was a perfect storm to get Europe and US to, to join forces and you know approach China but Instead, Donald Trump you know, starts throwing starbursts at Angela Merkel. So we're really having a, a period where most people would think that the transatlantic relationship should be tightened. Uh, it's actually very much in distress, I would say. Um, it's one US president can change that. But in one sense, um, Donald Trump is saying a lot of the same things that Barack Obama said, but he just says it in a lot less polite form. And uh, this transatlantic alliance uh, is, or I'll give you a recent example. Last week it was discovered by, um, it was reported in the German press that the EU delegation in, in Washington DC was downgraded and no one even bothered to tell them. They only found out when uh, George Bush died and the head of delegation wondered why he wasn't at the top of the list for the invitation since he's the most senior diplomat in Washington DC. So there's a real souring uh, with the relationship and I'm, I'm very concerned about this. And so this is kind of forcing Europe to look for other partners, other options, and I think this is actually drawing them towards India. We see uh, a publication, uh, you know, things do move slow and I understand that, but there has been um, some movement. Now, they just published the EU strategy for India. I know there's some uh, people feel that they didn't work as closely as they could with India on that, but I think it's a big step and it's an important starting point. Um, yesterday, we saw on this panel for the Quad, Admiral, um, the French Admiral Christophe Prazuk, uh, and I think that's important, all right? The EU is deeply divided. There is no consensus on China, so it will make it difficult for them to act together. But we also see France. Uh, there's a new book out by Harsh Pant. He was the editor, so I bought it here at, the, at Ricina, and I immediately you know, looked for European Union. It's not even mentioned in there. Uh, but France is mentioned seven times. Britain's not mentioned, but Tony Blair got one mention. So there is this, you know, France has an interest. We saw it yesterday with him on the panel, so I think that's a key. Uh, area of, of cooperation. Um, in the past, Europe could be accused of benign neglect towards India. Uh, they're, they had a very xenocentric focus. For them, Asia meant China, and they had a great deal of investment in that region. There were other complaints for, for the region as well, but Europe is also a big investor in ASEAN. So I think they're, they're coming up to speed on the shrinking geopolitical spectrum and, and having more of a role in the area. Um, Okay, so, and there has been a seismic shift in views on China. Uh, you know, Europe has been a huge investor in China, but as I said earlier, they, they have the same complaints as the US, but internally, uh, China has created sub-regional groupings within Europe. The 16 plus one is 11 EU member states, five possible accession states. So this is something that Brussels is extremely confused, uh, concerned about, and this prevents Europe from actually speaking with one voice. So China's strategic investments have been a wake-up call for, for European policymakers. The China 2025 um, invest, uh, strategy, and you know, it's only natural that uh, a developing economy wants to move up the value-added chain they published this, and I think the sale of the robotics company KUKA, the German, Germany has 12 robotics companies, KUKA is the number one. This was a, a big wake-up call for technology interests in, in Europe. So uh, this year we've seen an FDI screening mechanism make it 
you know, Europe does move slowly, but they managed to get this through in one year. They don't talk about China, but it's definitely aimed at China's uh, strategic investments in Europe. China went from zero to 10% uh, interest in European ports. So Europe feels, you know, China's presence uh, very much in their neighborhood. The idea of the Indo-Pacific actually psychologically pulls Europe closer to the region, I think. Uh, with the base in Djibouti, you know, China's getting closer in their neighborhood. We've seen uh, Russia-China exercises within Europe's neighborhood. For example, from the Mediterranean uh, two years ago and then Baltic uh, one year ago, a maritime exercise. So I think Europe is, is waking up to the China challenge as, uh, as well as, as India. So um, as I mentioned, the EU has a strategy on India uh, and that's a good point of, uh, of cooperation and Europe, India needs to learn more about the EU and the EU needs to understand India more. So I think that this is a, a good point of reference. And as this is the year of the boar, Europe's fence sitting may need to come to an end. They're gonna have to start making some decisions. Uh, I think they see India as a, a great place to invest money. Now that things are getting more difficult to invest in, in China and the slowing of the Chinese economy and the forced technology transfer. So India is an area that I think Europe should invest in. And um, in regard to also the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, India has always been skeptical about that. Europe has not embraced it uh, as warmly as other parts of the world, but there has been a pushback. And I think that joining with democratic forces and, and countries that want to have um, sustainable, sustainable investment, um, an equal playing field, you know, China's always going to be here, so we want to try to shape and, and work with them. And everyone is interested in infrastructure and investments. <clears throat> um, so to conclude, there is one area I think of, of great uh, Indian, Europe, US cooperation. The UN uh, documents had Belt and Road in it, and it was spearheaded by some young, ambitious Indian diplomats to get this language removed. And it was an example of US India and Europe working together to remove that. So the last bits of the BRI language in UN documents was removed in December. So that's a point where they worked together and it had a very positive outcome. Um, and lastly, uh, sustainable connectivity. The EU is putting some money into this. So there's, uh, as Helga Schmidt announced, there's 60 billion and uh, joining with the private sector, uh, they, they expect to magnify that by 10 times. So. Uh, I think it's time for Europe and India to join hands and, and really understand that these democracies need to work together. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Teresa, just a follow-up, a uh, quick question. Um, you know, the, you spoke about the benign neglect that Europe often has of India. Um, I think the uh, sentiment is somewhat mutual. Uh, sometimes India is guilty of benign neglect towards Europe. Um, and yet, at the same time, Prime Minister Modi, I think, has visited at least 11 countries in Europe during his tenure. I think made it possibly 15 plus visits uh, to Europe. Um, India, obviously Indian officials find the European Union's processes sometimes a bit Byzantine and, and archaic. And again, the sentiment I think is mutual. Um, but how would you suggest India best engage Europe? Is it through sub-regional groupings? Is it bilaterally? Should it be investing more in engagement with EU institutions? I think across the board, uh, I think it's um, the, t the the time is very ripe, I think, bilaterally, because uh, different member states won't have such an interest in maritime security issues. Europe right now, um, the institutions right now are drafting a Central Asia strategy, so I think India will be a key uh, player. They're having the meeting right now, as I speak in, 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 in Delhi. So I think that uh, they've been slow off the mark, but I think that there is a, a growing understanding that Central Asia, Afghanistan, all these issues will really have an effect on Europe, so they, they need to work together. And I think India has, you know, India has always had China as their neighbor, and now they're kind of got this interesting creative approach, and I think we should work together in trying to, you know, mesh it together. It's, it's very difficult right now. I think um, it's because of this inability for Europe to speak with one voice, I think putting a little um, increasing dialogue and habits of cooperation with India will pay off in the long term. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, if I can turn to uh, uh, David Malone. Um, 
uh, you've been uh, both a diplomat who has engaged with India both multilaterally at the United Nations and bilaterally uh, here in New Delhi, uh, but you've also been a scholar and a writer about India and its external relations. And one of the uh, conclusions that you've uh, drawn, uh, at least, uh, is, is that uh, India has a, a record of often uh, despite the self-conception of India as a, a strong multilateral player, uh, of often uh, abstaining on key international decisions, uh, or often complicating um, international consensus. Do you think India is overcoming that reputation? Uh, and if not, uh, what should India be doing to, what are the consequences of that? Well, thank you very much for that, Dhruva. First of all, it's great to be cheered by you a young Indian who has had a brilliant career in the Washington think tank world and has now come back home. It's terrific. I want to pay tribute to uh, Samir Saran, uh, who powers a young team that has done such a great job of hosting us here, and mention the Global Fellows in the back, on that stage in the back. I think they're the single most <coughs> exciting feature of this meeting. It's, on average, a very young meeting, and that's a huge tribute to the organizer-in-chief, uh, Samir Saran. Um, coming to India was a life-altering experience for me of the best <clears throat> kind, and thinking about its foreign policy, its strategic positioning, was a way for me of extending my stay here after I left. And so it continues in, in slow motion. So thank you for the specific question, uh, Druva. I think the thing that's been happening over the last 10 years since I left is India has been developing weight in the international system. It hasn't thrown around its weight particularly, but it has growing weight. The other country that has growing weight that I can think of is Brazil, which has done India the tribute of sending one of its great <coughs> citizens, Andrea uh, Correa de Lago, <coughs> as the new ambassador to uh, India. Now the question is, what will India do with this weight? Uh, can not use it, that's perfectly legitimate, or it can use it. Over the past four or five years with some friends, I've been working in slow motion on a research project on TPP. We had two brilliant contributions from Indians. One from Professor Chimney of uh, JNU in Delhi, which was a total demolition job of a TPP, a crime against humanity, the worst thing ever, uh, and uh, brilliantly executed. Uh, the second was by one of India's multilateralists, uh, Harsha Vardana Singh, who was deputy head of the WTO secretariat, who didn't make a strong case for TPP, but asked the question, if not the TPP, what? And invited uh, thought on what configuration of uh, friends, allies, partners, India is going to uh, want to develop to further power its own development track, which really took off about 20 years ago and has accelerated mightily, such that now uh, it's the fastest growing big economy uh, in the world. So uh, there are those two extremes in Indian foreign policy uh, uh, analysis. One, very lucid <coughs> critiques of other people's ideas, and the other, a questing mind looking for positive solutions to India's remaining uh, challenges. So I think here, I don't have any advice for India, I just uh, identify a certain pattern, which isn't a new pattern in Indian thinking, 
and I'm going to go on observing what India decides to do for itself with great interest and great sympathy. Uh, you know, one of the rare areas in which India, I mean, this actually mattered quite significantly for India, but uh, an early multilateral negotiation in the 1950s and 1960s involved nuclear disarmament. And it was one area where uh, the expert George Perkovich uh, wrote where India had the moral authority, it was correct in its, uh, and firm in its beliefs, but it lacked the power to actually enforce it. And uh, that resulted, as we know, in some suboptimal outcomes, both for India and some might say for the international disarmament uh, movement. Now that India, in some ways, the situation is a bit reversed. Mm. Uh, do you think uh, India, I mean, in your observations and your experience, is today capable of developing that alternative that you said, you know, it, it's, it's fine critiquing others, it's fine asking the probing questions. Is it, is there now, is India able to put something on the table on, on certain issues? Well, I would argue it's already happened in effect. Um, we heard from uh, Truva's father, Jay Shankar, yesterday. I was fortunate to know his grandfather also, the great Indian <coughs> geostrategic <coughs> thinker, K. Subramania. And K. Subramaniam, when the Cold War ended, argued that everything changed for India. It was a world of opportunity for India now. And his intuition was India had to start making some decisions and seizing some opportunities. And the result of that, because it filtered through the Indian system, was the nuclear deal with the United States. That was India taking a risk. It was a big risk to take. It might not have worked. It did work. Uh, so I think increasingly India is going to be taking these calculated risks. But first, it has to decide which risks it wants to uh, venture. And that's something only Indians can do. The rest of us can have opinions. but. It's up to the Indians to decide which of those risks you want to undertake. Thank you so much, and thanks to all of the speakers for, for those presentations and that, that diversity of views that we heard. Um, there were certain themes that stood out to me, and I, I, I'm happy to elaborate upon those at the end. But let's turn to the audience for questions. We have about 15 minutes for questions. If you could please line up. I see somebody or some people already doing that lining up in front of the microphones here. So let's start with you, please. If all the people asking questions could please identify themselves and keep it to one question, not a comment. Thank you. TV Paul, I'm a professor of political science at McGill University in Canada and a former president of the International Studies Association. Just one question to uh, uh, the general. One of the things, I come back to Ca India almost every year, and what is missing is this country's growth is not reflected in the quality of life of India, uh, average India, which is unfortunate because it has been fastest growth rate for several years. But what is missing is the village to the corporate level, to uh, corporation level, to state level, the bureaucracy and political elite have not imbibed or socialized into this idea of great India or major power India. It becomes a problem because average Indian is still dreaming but not getting the delivery of services. Have you thought of transforming this quality of life parameters and bringing that together, encouraging the bureaucracy and political elite to think of India's greatness lies in their micro behavior. That is, when they sit over a fire for <coughs> hours or days, they are hurting India's chances of great power status. China has done that quite a bit. The Communist Party's delivery of services is an indication of their desire for greatness. What can India do to improve the quality of life? for millions of people who are still languishing in, in the villages of India. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. General, would you like to answer that question, please? Uh, you, you have a, a legitimate uh, assumption, if I can uh, put it that way. But let me say that uh, in a young democracy, in a democracy which is vibrant, a uh, country which uh, has ensured that democracy is followed in proper form, you will always have this dissonance that you are talking of. All democracies have that. 
and uh, the finesse and the ability lies in ensuring that this dissonance is brought into resonance which will ensure what you are talking of. It is happening. In any democracy, you will see always that the progress in these matters is always slower. I think what we have witnessed in the last four and a half years should convince you that we are on the right path. Thank you. Uh, yep. ah, yes, please. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Sharma. I want to ask a question to David. You mentioned about the nuclear deal. Is nuclear energy alive today in the world? Because in 2017, we added only 2,000 megawatt capacity. The costs are exorbitantly high. World over, uh, no new nucle nuclear capacities are coming up. So what's your view on that? Thank you. I think we can take a few other questions uh, then. Uh, so maybe Nilanti here, and then we'll go, I'll go around to, I see four, four people here. So please. Sure. Uh, Nilanti from CNA. Uh, my question is for General Singh. In considering India's ambition to be a leading power, what, does it, what can the United States provide? Or what does India need from the United States to enable its ambition to become a leading power? Thank you. We'll take a few more questions. The gentleman here, please. Good morning. My name is Patrick Kugel. I'm from the Polish Institute of International Affairs in, in, in Warsaw. Uh, it was a brilliant uh, panel and very interesting discussion, but we haven't heard too much about uh, the new, uh, new Delhi consensus. What is it all about? If you can give us more specific characteristic of this, this, this vision of world affairs and uh, how is it different and this, how, how it can distinguish itself from the Washington consensus or N Beijing consensus? Uh, does it apply more to economic field or political uh, or strategic? Uh, can, can you tell us more how uh, India can add to uh, solving uh, today's challenges? Thank you. Uh, and finally, the lady over there. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Veronica Portugal. I am from Mexico. And you mentioned part of the foreign affairs strategy of India in Europe and China. But what about the Indian presence in Latin America and Africa to cooperate together in the international field? Thank you. So uh, perhaps, uh, General Vikasing, if you could take one question was addressed to you. Uh, what can uh, the US do to enable India's rise uh, as a leading power? And one question uh, to David, if you could maybe first to General first, please. Uh, when you speak of what US can do, I'll put a counter question. What can the whole world do? We have made a lot of friends. You gain from each friend. Any country which goes uh, on a path uh, which it charts for itself, looks for advantages from all friends. Any country which is able to harness technology properly, any country which is able to get technology that is able to make things better for itself, make the lives of its own people better, to ensure that the economic progress takes place, will always move in the front ranks. And uh, that is where each country counts, not just the United States. Um, if I can also address a question, the last question on Latin America as well to, to uh, David Mons. So on, on nuclear energy and, and on uh, does nuclear energy have a future and how have uh, India and Latin America collaborated? Uh, I think nuclear energy does have a future. For one thing, it's clean. It presents risks, but Dirty energy presents lots of risks in today's world, too. So I think it does have a future. Uh, I think if people are disappointed that the nuclear deal didn't produce instantly a huge increase in India's uh, electrical grid and capacity, that misses the point in a way of what the nuclear deal was about. The nuclear deal was about graduating India from a sort of purda to which it had been confined by having a nuclear weapons uh, program to something much more legitimate, openly recognized internationally. I think it was for India a fantastic uh, achievement myself. Uh, I'd like to say a word about the idea of consensus and India. 
This is the wrong country for consensus. <laughs> the argumentative Indian is alive and well. So if you're looking for consensus, I'm afraid it will have to be elsewhere. On Latin America and Africa, uh, there I think India has tremendous advantages. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> Indian trading communities spread all over the Caribbean, into parts of Latin America, into large parts of Africa. These are a human bridge between India and those continents. Secondly, India's emergence is a very hopeful phenomenon for African countries, for a number of Latin American countries. I mentioned that Brazil is in many ways on a parallel track to India as a rising, meaningful global power. And uh, it does not have, actually, all the advantages India has had through its very entrepreneurial, self-exporting citizenry who went all over the world to make a living, benefited my country, Canada, by coming in very large numbers to Canada. These human bridges are a huge asset for India, it seems to me. If I can divert the question on uh, more detail about the New Delhi consensus to two of the panelists, one uh, to Teresa on uh, India, of course, uh, argued against the Belt and Road Initiative and, and did not attend the Belt and Road, uh, did not send a representative to the Belt and Road Forum last year. How much did the arguments, the normative arguments that India made, uh, resonate in Europe? And does that reflect in some ways the out outlines of an Indian normative uh, position? Uh, and then to, to uh, Minister Maliki as well, um, when you mentioned Prime Minister Modi's speech at the Shangri-La Dialogue where he spoke about a free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific, how much did the normative elements of that speech resonate with, uh, in, in Singapore and with Southeast Asia? So, Terence. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I know India uh, did not attend the Belt and Road Forum, otherwise known as BARF. Uh, some European leaders did, that, but not that many, and it's almost like herding cats, but um, Jyrki Katainen, the vice president, managed to maintain discipline, which was pretty amazing when you consider you have 28, soon to be 27 member states, and nobody signed the MOU uh, at the Belt and Road Forum. Since then, China has been trying to pick off member states, but I think India is a good sign of you know, norms, and I think the Europeans really are concerned about the Belt and Road courts, um, the declining level of uh, norms because even the World Bank, it's slowly eroding. I mean, they have to lower their standards a bit in order to, you know, compete with Chinese uh, investments. Um, there's one other area I think India and Europe can can work together is in Africa, especially with this Indian diaspora there. Um, and I had the pleasure of uh, spending an hour with your dad yesterday, uh, and so I picked his brain about the Delhi consensus because I have been asking everyone here about the Delhi consensus, and. Um, I'm going to borrow his idea. He said, since China has thrown away their, their, their playbook on bide your time and hide your light, maybe India should do that. Because soon as you, you know, announce a, a consensus, like the Beijing consensus, which wasn't really even drafted by the, the Chinese, it was uh, drafted by a Kissinger associate, uh, Ramo. So it kind of makes you a target. So maybe the best thing to do is just, uh, China, uh, India has many challenges. We see the, the environment today, um, economy, uh, security. So work hard, um, bide your time, and uh, good luck. <laughs> Minister? Thank you very much. Yes, um, yeah, the, the, the concept of free and open in the Pacific has been discussed quite a bit. And in the discussion on consensus, I think there is still no consensus either <laughs> uh, in relation to what it really means. Uh, ASEAN ministers spoke about it, discussed about it uh, during the Shangri-La Dialogue and several of other platforms. And indeed, there's no consensus whether in relation to this nomenclature, whether it's in relation to uh, the geographic scope, or even the focus areas. You know? So I think it's, it's still open for discussion. But what's important really is, from Singapore's perspective, uh, we, we, are, we are open to uh, the, uh, any of these uh, proposals, but uh, pro with certain conditions. One is, um, as long as the, uh, the proposal supports the centrality and unity of ASEAN, and that's really articulated by uh, Prime Minister Modi also uh, in his speech, 
At the same time, the proposal should uh, articulate a coherent uh, strategy for economic engagement in the region. Uh, thirdly, espouse a um, world order, the rules-based world order that's anchored on international law. And certainly, finally, support the regional architecture that's really open and inclusive. I think uh, as we continue to engage uh, and find consensus of sorts with regards to even this topic of free and open in the Pacific, I think we should uh, look at some of these uh, broad criteria that we thought is useful for us to start thinking about and, and, and bring uh, the, the, these issues on the discussion table. So one last question. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but the gentleman over there has been very patient. Uh, very good morning. Uh, my name is Commodore Watson. I represent the Chennai Center for China Studies and the National Maritime Foundation. The question is for uh, General V.K. Singh. Uh, so no discussion is complete today without uh, bringing in China uh, into the room. Call it the elephant, call it the dragon. The uh, point is that uh, we have come a long way from uh, Doklam to Wuhan, and there seems to be some kind of a rapprochement. But the point is there are some basic issues on which China will not concede even an inch. I'm talking about the NSG, the UNSC, the prescription of uh, Azhar Masood, uh, or border disputes, Arunachal Pradesh, etc. In this kind of a climate, where you know it's not likely to sort of give any way, but it's also itself coming under pressure because of uh, uh, Trump's policies, uh, it's trying to perhaps engage more with uh, India. We're still not able to bring down our trade deficit. How do you see the future of India-China relation in this kind of a backdrop, which is very challenging for us in the next five to 10 years. Uh, let me, first of all, uh, uh, lay down a little equation. In diplomacy, there are no hard lines. In diplomacy, the finish lies in ensuring that you look at the challenges in a manner in which you can ultimately solve them. Time. <coughs> Yes, in certain issues will be of essence, but otherwise you have to soften what otherwise looks hard. And uh, the way we are progressing with uh, China in our relationship, we are very positive. We are uh, uh, enthusiastic about how things will shape up in the future. So let's uh, wait for uh, time because uh, both uh, in China and India, Time has a different uh, norm. Uh, thank you. I think we're out of time uh, speaking of that. Um, but I do want to thank all the panelists. I think we reached no consensus about the New Delhi consensus, <laughs> but that's fine. Um, but uh, a few thoughts uh, you know, d did uh, uh, stand out in, 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 the in the comments made by the panelists for me, a few themes. Uh, one was several of them mentioned democracy, uh, both as uh, um, a value as uh, that India cherishes obviously and shares with many others, but also in some ways as a complicating factor in India's ability to get things done and also work with like-minded partners, whether it's the European Union, whether it's the United States, whether it's Israel, whether it's others. Uh, a second was the general principle of openness. Uh, I think we saw uh, several, uh, including Minister Maliki mention, highlight uh, uh, that and, and how much that is appreciated, uh, whether again in India or uh, overseas, whether it's economic openness, whether it's other, as other elements of that political openness as well. Um, and then fi my final thought is I, I uh, appreciated uh, Ambassador Malone's uh, uh, final uh, point on um, uh, that uh, India will now has started to take risks in some areas, uh, calculated risks. And I think the question really is in what areas it will take, uh, be taking risk. But with, on that note, thank you uh, to all the panelists for taking your uh, time to be with us here today. And thank you for all the questions.